This measuring up series um, is it's a challenge because there's areas I'm guilty in. And I always hate it when it seems like, for some of you, it seems like I'm pointing a finger at you, and I have three or four more pointing back at me of myself. Here's the setting I want us to think about, and if you got the email um, Friday, you saw just a little advertisement for this. There are 24 million, 24 million children in the United States of America who do not have a biological father present in their lives. Now, I know some of you are going through other pains. You've, you've lost a parent, um, and I don't mean to minimize that in any way. But the story we're going to look at today is about what happens when dads aren't present. And there's lots of reasons why dads aren't present. For some of them, beyond the 24 million, there's a dad who's physically present, but he's sure not emotionally present. He's sure not relationally present. And by far stretch, he's not spiritually present. And what have we become? What have we become? It's kind of hard for me to imagine. Because God has blessed me with four kids. And I can't think of anything greater. I enjoy time with my wife. I enjoy time with my kids. And some of you, you're able to say, and God has blessed me beyond that, into grandchildren and into great-grandchildren. And you say, it's hard for me, too, to picture. That there's 24 million out there that don't have dad present. Seriously, what could be more important? What could be more valuable than spending time with your kids? It's a courageous thing to lead a family. And this morning we're going to talk about the difference between wimps and warriors. And our key verse that this all wraps around comes from the story in Judges. And if you want to find a Bible and turn to there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So you get to what, number seven? Judges chapter six is this, this little funny phrase. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And some of you are starting to smile because you know the story of Gideon. Let me get you into the story just a little bit. And Judges chapter 6 is where it all begins. And some of these I won't have up on the screen. I'm going to read to you for a moment. It says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, notice that word again. Ron shared you a story last week. And in the time that's passed since Abraham went to follow God, many, many things have happened. And as God's people went into bondage for 400 years in slavery in Egypt and have come out, there have been seasons of following God and seasons of not following God. And we're back to one of those not following God kind of times. So again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years... He gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, that's a thing people don't like to read. God gave them into the hands of the Midianites. You mean God caused pain? Yes, God allowed pain. He allowed their enemies, the Midianites, to take over. And here's how bad it was. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. And when the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their flocks, their livestock, and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. And Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Can I just say, maybe you won't get anything else for the rest of the message. Maybe you'll just grab that one little point right there. Sometimes God allows the pain in your life to finally get your attention. And God allowed for seven years this to happen to the Israelites so that they would finally come to that point of crying out to God for help. 
Stop trying to do it on your own and cry out to the Lord for help. And here's what happens. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. Catch this. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you've not listened to me. And, and there's the problem. God has spoken through a prophet and confronted them and said, the problem is that you've not listened to me. It's not that I haven't provided time and time again. God did provide. But they chose not to listen. And that sets up the story for God to be able to do a great work through someone who was not ready. And here's how it sits today. For several reasons, we've abandoned God and the willingness to do the right thing. You want to talk about the problems in our country today? It's because we, as the believers, have abandoned following God and doing the right thing time after time after time. And we'll go over some reasons why. First thing is that men have abandoned their homes because they have abandoned God. Men have abandoned their homes. It's not hard to look around and to go to things. It baffles me as I go to Cub Scouts. And here's an organization I thought was going to be so strong. I wanted this for Jackson. And many times I'm the only dad that's there. Now I'm not saying that women can't be good leaders in this. But here's a specific thing to train up boys in becoming men. And the men are gone. It scares me. It frightens me. It makes me sad. The end of what we just read. God said that the problem was through the prophet, you have not listened to me. Because you've not listened to me, there are problems. We can usually have some pretty good hindsight. They say hindsight's 2020. We can look back and we can reevaluate things. But looking forward, what happens if we abandon God? Second thing, men have abandoned their homes because they're afraid. Guys won't admit it out loud. For many men, there's just so many things we're afraid of. How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to take care of college for my kids? How am I going to do this by the time I retire? There's all kinds of areas in life that men are afraid and it goes on in the story and says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. It's hard for us because most of us have never had to thresh wheat. I know I certainly haven't had to. And the story, if you're not familiar with it, is setting up this picture of an absolute loss of hope. You see, the wine press is not the place where you thresh wheat. The wine press is the place where you make wine. Pretty tough. I know the language is pretty tough there. The wine press is down in the valley. And the place where you would thresh wheat is way up on top of a hill. You would normally do that. You would be, as you're shucking it, you're throwing the chaff up in the air and the wind over the top of the hill blows it away. You usually do that and it involves animals who are pulling on that with donkeys. But if you remember how we started the story, I said that God had allowed the Midianites to come in. And they didn't have any animals anymore. So here's this picture of Gideon, this, this man who's hungry because all their food keeps getting wiped out by the Midianites. And rather than doing what you would normally do up on the top of the hill, he's down in a wine press, hiding 
trying to scrape by with a little bit of food. And it doesn't go so well. It says that there's this angel that comes to him and speaks to him. If you remember our key verse when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response is, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Ooh. He's lost faith. And in fact, he's blaming all the things that are happening on God. And he's not looking like a mighty warrior. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And there's the issue. Men have abandoned their homes because they're weak. And Gideon says, What you're telling me, it just doesn't make sense. I, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. God's abandoned us. How could I possibly do that? How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. You know, there's times we do that as a church. Well, what could we do? There's only so many of us. We've only got so many resources in the bank. How, how can we do this thing if God is calling us, which I believe he is, to impact this community and beyond? There's a lot of times we have this weakness of looking at what can I do in my own strength. But here's where it turns. In the next verse, the angel of the Lord speaks to him. And the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Here's the thing. What would life be like if we lived every day believing that promise? If we lived every day believing that God is with us? That's why we sing that song like we did this morning. If God's with us, who can stand against us? Because God is awesome. And his word tells us he does go before us. God likes to do that. God likes to use the weak things in the world. He likes to take those who believe that there's no way they can do it on their own and then work through them. We read that from 2 Corinthians 12.10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, writing to remind the Corinthian church, Paul's been through lots of hardships. There's things that God has called Paul to do that there's no way he could do on his own. In fact, he reminds someone else of that. We see it in 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Is that the God that you know? Is that the God that you know who has given you a spirit of power? Because too many times we get trapped looking at the wrong things. And we forget who the God is. We look at the mountain and forget the mountain maker. God's awesome and he's able. Here's the thing that makes the switch in Gideon's life. And we see it today. that Rather than abandoning us, God chooses to transform and strengthen us. And there's some of you who are experiencing that fresh right now. God is doing something in your lives that's enabling you to go beyond the things that you thought you could ever possibly do. And that's awesome. He strengthens us. First thing we would say is that God consumes us. And we get that picture in his response. Gideon is talking to the, the angel that's there and says, well, let me, let me bring an offering and set it before you. Verse 19 says, Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. 
The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. And with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abiers rites. And what a neat picture of the way Ron said it last week. Anytime someone built an altar, it was because it was a place of worship. And the response that Gideon has is to worship God. God consumes us. Have you ever thought of that concept? It says it in his word. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God wants to consume the old you and work in his power in your life. Second thing God does, God breaks us. I don't know how many of you can say amen to that. There comes a point in your life where God breaks us. I've been trying to think of where we're going in this series. We said initially we we're going to talk about um, David in January. And we're coming back and forth to David. And I gave Ron freedom to do whatever he wanted to do last week. And um, he didn't come back to David, and that was all right. God breaks us. God comes into our lives, and I'm so grateful for it. Because I know that there was a path that I was on, and when he came into my life, he redirected that. He breaks us. And we talk about people throughout this series who have had that encounter with God where things begin to get all kinds of different in their lives. He breaks us to accomplish his purpose. Maybe you never thought of that that way. There was a young woman who was getting ready to get married. And God came into her life and said, you're going to have a son. God broke into Mary's life and change the path that her life was on. There's others, like David. Goes from a shepherd boy to a mighty king. Listen to what it says in chapter 7. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that their own strength has saved her, Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Going into battle, you don't normally want to give guys the option to leave. You want the greatest army possible, and God just gets Gideon's attention. He says, I want you to tell him it's okay. I've got this covered. And in a moment, thousands upon thousands leave. In verse 4, it continues, But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, This one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, This one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. And I bet at that moment, Gideon is hoping, okay, Lord, get rid of the 300 and let me have the rest. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. God breaks us that way at times. There's certain things that we allow into our lives to think that we get strength from them. 
Some of you may be able to look back at a time where you had a really good job and you had let that become too much of a priority in your life. And God intervened and broke you, and all of a sudden, you're unemployed. Because it took that to get you to depend back on God again. God has all kinds of ways to do that. Sometimes it's through disease. Sometimes it's through lack of work. But just like it did to Gideon, God breaks us every now and then so that we come back to depending on him. But here's the neat thing. God uses us. When we open our lives up to him, he wants to, and he uses us. The end of the story. Gideon and the 300 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. Did you hear any hand-to-hand -hand combat yet? God's called them to go. They go in the night. And they make a bunch of noise. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. Grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Sheeta towards Zerah, and as far as the borders of Abel Mahola near Tabith. Not exactly what Gideon expected. Gideon expected that when God called him to lead his people into battle, that we're going to take as many as we can get, and somehow a little guy mustered up 32,000 of them. And then 300 do the unthinkable, they go without weapons. They go with torches and jars. That's not what I would advocate for a way to go into battles with torches and jars. But God does the work. Maybe sometimes that's our issue. We've not looked at it that way, that God wants to use us, but he does the work. It's great as you go through and you read when God's people came into the promised land. How much did they have to do versus how much did God do on their behalf when they trusted him? God wants to work in your life. He wants to use us. And that's the message. God wants to use you to accomplish his purposes. God wants to use you. Even with all of your flaws, even with all of your weaknesses, even with all of your habits, God wants to use each one of us. There's not a person in this room that God doesn't have a reason for that he wants to accomplish a purpose what are those purposes well he wants this area that we live in to know him he wants this area that we live in to know him to love him to worship him with everything they've got and it starts with you and I so I want to encourage you that sometimes we look at the battles the way Gideon did I said, oh, Lord, if I just had more. Oh, I think I've got enough resources finally. And what would it be like if we turn from wimps to warriors? What would it be like if you and I attack this place around us like crazy madmen who lapped up water like a dog? Because that's who God wanted to use to have the courage to go do something that was absolutely amazing. God wants to use us to accomplish his purpose. As long as Christ tarries and we wait for his return, we are the hands and feet of God, the body of Christ, the church. We are the bride of Christ, and we wait for the bridegroom to come. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, I thank you for this story that you've preserved for us in your word. I love the story of Gideon because... Here's a man who came to trust you. Lord, he had no reason on his own to ever imagine the things that you would do. And it's just like me. Father, the things that you have called in my life so far are things I never imagined. And yet you want to do that with every one of us. 
No, we won't all go into a physical battle. But Lord, there's a spiritual battle that you've called us into. There's a battle around us for men to rise up and lead their families. And it doesn't stop the day that our kids turn 18 and they go out the door. It continues on into their adult lives. When we have our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, you've called us to be men that lead our families, to influence by your word. It takes men to be courageous. It takes men to be like Gideon, to say, Lord, if you're with me, then I will go. And Lord, even if you strip away everything else that I thought was my strength, God, still I will follow. So this morning, Lord, I pray that we would be men and women who do that in our community. That we would reach out into our world and not be afraid of what others might say. To not be weak as we sometimes are at home. But Lord, to trust in you. To share a word of encouragement with those that need to know you. God, thank you again for those who did that yesterday at Relay for Life. God, we want to be a church that is known that we are courageous and stand up for you, Jesus. We stand by those who need you and know you. And Father, now as we give back to you our tithes and offerings, Father, would you take it and bless us as we continue to follow you. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us. In your name we pray. Amen.